Last October, my wife and I began this venture of building a new home. The problem when you watch a lot of episodes of Home Extreme Makeover is that you get under this illusion that you can build a home in a year. Now, I, I recognize we didn't have dozens of contractors and people working around the clock. Uh, it all didn't count on you know, contractors that would leave for months on end or weeks on end and just didn't show up. But I guess somehow I just thought this whole thing should be a whole lot easier. Now, if you've ever had the privilege of watching a barn raising, either I mean, live would be awesome, but most of us probably have seen them. Uh, you can't help but be in awe of the, uh, you know, the, the collaboration, the teamwork, the purpose, and, and really the community that you see as people band together to do something pretty incredible in a short period of time, and then again celebrating this at the end, and uh, just enjoying one another's company. And of course today our farmers would have all kinds of means in which to look after these things for ourselves. We no longer sort of need the, the, the rallying of the troops, so to speak. Now, as somebody who grew up in the 1960s and 70s, I was privileged to be part of something that we now know, uh, we now call the pop-in. Yeah. It's a light. Come on. You lame? Yeah. This person does not believe in telephones, does she? She likes the pop-in. I've told her how I hate the pop-in. He likes the pop-in, too. Just pop-in now. I'm a big pop-in guy. <laughs> My friend. Oh, huge pop-in guy. <laughs> Yeah, so I was, I was part of a big pop-in family. We were big pop-in people. We liked people popping in our house. Uh, you know, usually a couple times a week, doorbells would ring. People would just kind of come in, right? Make themselves at home and just have a great visit. And at no time as a kid, you know, sort of watching this, did I think this was maybe normal or unusual. But of course, uh, things have changed and, and the pop-in is sort of a lost art. And I was reminiscing about this on my blog about a year and a half ago, thinking about what this meant to me as a child where where you had this sense of trust and community where people could just sort of come in randomly, you know, no need to sort of get the house clean and, and bake a fancy meal or, or my wife quickly send me out to the superstore to get dessert or whatever it is. And, you know, a number of people would respond and say, yes, I remember that. That was a wonderful time. And, and thinking about what the implications were about the pop-in uh, to us as a society. And I think in many respects we have traded uh, community for our busyness. And things like privacy and achievement and money, which aren't bad things in and of themselves, but I think we need to recognize when we do sort of shift that way what we've sort of lost uh, as a result. So as we began this process of building our home, the one thing that we were desperate to try to avoid was the garage house. So you've seen these, right? These are these, this, this tribute to SUVs, two, three, four car garages, and then somewhere in the back, I think people live there, right? There's a house. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, these, these large lots and, and high fences, all to sort of gain more privacy, which leads to another problem that we have. And if you've ever tried to go from north, uh, northwest Calgary to southeast Calgary in under half an hour, good luck, right? I mean, this thing is just nuts how spread out it is. So, I began to think about, okay, so how did we get from, you know, this idea of barn raising and pop-ins to uh, garage houses and urban sprawl? So, after World War II, of course, there was quite, quite a, a, new, a newness, a new freedom. People began to take advantage of new products and technologies to make their lives easier. We had infrastructure that would, uh, that's built great highways connecting all kinds of towns, and actually people people were involved in lots of different organizations and social clubs, whether it was political, religious uh, affiliations, um, unions, athletic clubs, all kinds of places where people actually were involved in community. And then something began to happen. And around the 1960s, this began to start to decline. And Robert Putnam in his 2000 book, Bowling Alone, chronicles this, this sort of rise in rise in prosperity and decline in social capital. And, and really, simply put, we began to spend more time worrying about living and looking after ourselves than living with and looking after each other. So around the mid-90s, along comes this thing called the internet. And, and really began to awaken in us this lost sense of community and our ability to connect and find people online became an amazingly empowering thing. And so today, 
Today, you're only alone if you want to be. So it doesn't matter if you are um, an ice chewer <laughs> or a ninja Christian, <laughs> a bacon lover. How many bacon lovers do we have out there? Hey, there we go. <laughs> or whether you enjoy taking photos of things chewed by your dogs, which by the way is a community that I began. <laughs> And 14 of us enjoy taking photos of things our dog chews up. <clears throat> now, I'm not suggesting that you belong to any one of those particular communities, but what I am suggesting is that there is a place for people to gather and connect and enjoy whatever weird or wonderful thing that you love. And I think we're beginning to see some really amazing things happen in these, in these virtual communities. So let me look at the virtual <coughs> pop-in, if you will. So we, we just saw a video on Reddit. So he kind of described what Reddit is. I won't then. Um, so about a year ago, a young man posts a request on Reddit. He says, my mom just died of cancer. And I on the only photo that I have of her is one that I want to keep, but it's, it shows her wearing her canula, uh, her breathing apparatus. And he said, is anybody out there with mad Photoshop skills, could they somehow restore this picture to something that I could use and, and keep for, for my memories? And so a thousand people, a thousand people submitted all kinds of renditions of this photo and, and he found something that he really was quite, uh, quite taken with and, and definitely wanted to use. So he posted his, um, his thoughts and thanking people and was just overwhelmed with, with the response that people, that people gave and talked about how his family was touched. But I like what he says at the end of this little, uh, this little message. He said that I've always visited Reddit, but now we'll consider it home. So this is not some frivolous, time-wasting space of a place. While there may be some of that going on, he thinks of this as home. That's pretty telling. Now there's also some, I mean, that's sort of one simple, and I, I call that a pop-in in the fact that people are able to sort of quickly come in, do what they need to do. It, it's, not a big, it's not a big effort for a lot of those people, but pretty significant in the lives of, of some. But there's other things that I would sort of categorize as a barn-raising type events. So um, Eric Whitaker is a... Uh, is a composer, conductor, and along with 185 people from 12 different countries did something pretty amazing. It all started with this one young girl who sent me this, this video of herself singing one of my choral pieces. And I was struck so hard by it. the beauty, the intimacy of it, the sweetness of it. And I thought, well, it would be amazing if we could get 100 people to do this and cut it all together and make a virtual choir. So I then went into a studio and I conducted in total silence. I could only hear it in my head. And I loaded all of that up to YouTube. And I sent out a call to singers across the world. And the response was totally overwhelming. We had 185 singers from 12 different countries. It was all about connecting and about somehow connecting with these people all over the world. And these individuals alone together. For me, singing together and making music together is it's a fundamental human experience. And I love the idea that technology can bring people together from all over the world and still sort of participate in this, this transcendent experience. So I spend my day job um, looking with, working with teachers and students and looking at how technology supports that learning. And, and it's a great job. I love it. I get to do really amazing kind of interesting things. But, but I will tell you that for the most part, the problem we have right now is that we're still in this mind your own business learning mind, this uh, um, framework. And it must sit still, keep your eyes on your paper, don't look at your neighbor. All those things. I'm sure all those things are things that you've heard in your experience in school. And while that may be changing a little bit, it's still the predominant culture of schools. And even technology itself has not done anything necessarily to change that. Um, we have people still staring at screens, working by themselves. And really we have not begin, begun as, a, as an education system to tap into this idea of social learning. The idea that every student comes to the table with something. There's something that they bring and tapping into that collective intelligence and, and honoring and recognizing that 
and, and figuring out what that means as a collective is something we need to shift towards. And the teacher now becomes, the role is much more of a connector as much as it is content expert and maybe more. The other thing that we need to recognize is the whole impact of global learning. We really have never had a choice in the way that we brought people, learners together. It's all been about the fact that you live on the same street and you're roughly the same age, put you in a room together and you learn. And, and really, it's not that we don't want to honor that local. We, we need to be able to live in local communities and work with one another, but we do have a choice now. We can, we can move beyond the local. Being here is being there. I just, I just love that video. I mean, so much joy in there. And here's people ex sharing the same experience locally and globally. Uh, just a wonderful, I mean, in our schools could use a whole lot more joy. I can tell you that right now. But just this idea of, of people together sharing an experience, silly as it may be. And even beyond sort of that quick little pop-in example, the, the idea of an educational barn raising where teachers are doing some pretty remarkable things as they begin to think about what all this stuff can mean to them. So for example, a teacher in New Jersey uh, teaching Spanish gathers, has all his students learn Spanish in the context of their passion. So for example, one student may be passionate about uh, fashion, and so he actually connects that student with a Spanish speaker in, in Spain uh, who's blogging at the same time and allows them to have conversations back and forth and learn Spanish in that context. Uh, Julie, Julie uh, Lindsay is a teacher formerly in Bangladesh, Vicki Davis from Georgia, had read the book, Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and wanted to test out, is it indeed the world flat, and are the ideas and the topics presented in this book, uh, do they ring true? So they began to connect uh, themselves across, across the ocean, as well as several other classrooms, in exploring this idea and working collaboratively with other students and deciding, is this really true from your perspective? And they've since then uh, worked with over 4,000 students, over 50 different schools in over 20 different countries and actually brought them together three times uh, in their flat world conferences and workshops. And while those are awesome, great learning experiences that are planned and put together, there's something also to be said for things that just the serendipity of the moment, the informal, the educational pop-in. So as an avid Twitter user, Twitter gets a bad rap as being a place of silliness. And I would admit to you, there's lots of silliness going on. But we underestimate the value and power of silliness to connect and bring people together. And so just last week, I um, happened to have somebody invite me into a conversation that they were having live. And so I popped in. This gentleman's from New York City. He was talking with a teacher from Vancouver who was in uh, Sweden working with students in a global project. I mean, it's all, if you try to do this mapping project, you just go berserk trying to figure this out. But my investment in that community and my investment in those people allow me to have a learning experience that I otherwise would not possibly be able to have. So, and I can tell you that this, uh, this fosters real and powerful learning. Uh, Skype is another one of these amazing pop-in tools. My Skype is always on. People are ringing me two or three times a day, uh, even once in a while you share a meal together. How's that? And as a classroom tool, Skype offers some really amazing things as well whether it's a, a classroom tour of a, of a class in South Carolina, having a discussion with students in Nevada, bringing in a teacher from Korea to talk to my English teachers about, about that topic, or even a grade one student in one of my schools that says, hey, we got a new laptop, I wanna show you that. As humans, we're genetically wired to be social and live in community. And some people are trying to tell us that our devices and our connectivity is destroying community. And I would argue that we lost it a whole lot longer before the internet and social networking ever came along. Technology is allowing us to return to our roots. And I hope that we can be diligent in ensuring that these technologies make us more social and more human. Thank you.